So what happens with the neoliberal turn is not just that individuals are expected to be entrepreneurial and be on their own, but cities are increasingly expected to be entrepreneurial. So there was a moment, uh, partic uh, particularly after the Great Society, where cities would, res would pay out money in federal taxes and a proportion of that money they would get back in order to provide social services. But um, successfully through R Nixon and um, then um, Nixon and then Ford, then Carter, then Reagan, that money was cut. So you, you leave cities at the point where they've got this large, increasingly poor population because cities, uh, because manufacturers move out, because uh, middle class white flight, um, and they can't provide for the resources because they no longer have the tax, they no longer have the revenue to provide for social service, uh, provide the social services that those poor populations need. So what they do in that moment is they become increasingly entrepreneurial and they promote kind of a local trickle down philosophy where they're like, okay, if we do these things in downtown, then the results will trickle back to the residents, right? So you're talking about things like the creation of sports stadia, you know, bringing football teams back, bringing baseball teams back, and in some cases, actually taking them from other cities. Uh, downtown development, whether you're talking about something like the Inner Harbor in the case of Baltimore, the flats in the case of a city like Cleveland. So what happens in this case is a number of developers, they say, okay, we'll come to downtown and we'll develop, and in exchange, you give us these benefits, and then the benefits will trickle down. So that's the rhetoric that's usually used, but it very, very seldomly turns out, it very seldom turns out that way. That is, the results very rarely trickle down to the populations in general. What they end up doing is they end up accruing materially to the developers, and then to the extent that there's spillovers, the spillover consequences, like having a place that's cool to hang out downtown, those benefits accrue basically to people who aren't under the, uh, under the, the uh, surveillance of police, mm -hmm. right? So you're talking about middle class populations, urban class populations, regardless of, uh, I mean, upper class populations, regardless of race. I would say, um, I mean, it's difficult because there is um, a large amount, uh, I would say, of propaganda that has been kind of institutionally molded in our education institutions and places where many of us get our political education, universities, et cetera. Um, I would say the, the thing that I think would allow race literacy to be something that would be widespread is that I think it's necessary for you know, institutions to invest you know, resources in the development um, of curriculum and investing in individuals to provide that kind of race literacy. So in those groups of people who traditionally, you know, they don't, they don't talk about race, you need people who, it's their job to talk to people who don't talk about race. Um, and I think there are some institutions that have iterations of that. Um, but just in my experience, the places where you get that are just folks whose job it is to talk to folks who normally don't talk about it. Um, Give an example. Like, who would be those people? So an example, well, I think primarily those who, you know, dedicated their life's work to, you know, looking at these issues, um, particularly those who are from communities that are most directly confronted, um, you know, by the issues that um, come about as a result of racism and white supremacy. Um, I mean, uh, just a quick example, when I was at Towson University, I was on the SGA, I was the diversity representative, which was this thing they created the year that I was on the SGA for the purposes of, you know, formally having conversations about these issues so that the Student Government Association, you know, wasn't when, when issues of race would come up, it wasn't the first time that they had heard about it, it wasn't the first time that they, you know, had come across these terms and definitions. But it was kind of an institutional thing set aside so that folks had a way of addressing it um, outside of the context of like real time operation and you know doing the day to day work. One really good example is a policy debate, high school and policy debate. So one of the things that has happened fairly recently is, is that there is a practice in policy. So policy debate is the most academically rigorous co curricular activity there is. 
and you know it's heavy, it's research late, so it's not just about oratory. Is I think what a lot of people kind of misconstrue about debate. This one debate is about is it's evidence laden, and so one of the things that you'll find now in debate, which is a development that has happened over the past five to six years, is that debaters around the United States, debaters of color, particularly black debaters, um, have used their social location and cultural identity as a resource for the academic work they do in, in the activity, and therefore has served to educate many of the debaters on the national circuit, on co in the college and high school circuit, on issues of race that I think otherwise wouldn't have been the case. So for instance, in 2008, so in 2008, actually, I won uh, the cross-examination debate association national championships. The first time a team of two debaters did that, and we did it with an argument called the Black Aesthetic, which is an argument about you know being in a society that's saturated in European-centered cultural values, et cetera. And the idea was is that we needed a, a a cultural paradigm for looking at issues of public policy that gave aesthetic value to black bodies, right? Um, and so, what has happened now is that the debaters you know, all over the United States with high levels of success in doing that. And so now you have debaters from Harvard, from Michigan State, from Wake Forest, where they have an entire section in their, in their evidence tubs about race literature, right? And that wasn't the case a few years ago. And because debate, you know, the incentive is to win debates and the incentive is for people to get an intense understanding of it. Now you have coaches and debaters all over the country that are now more race literate than they were a few years back. But are the debaters speaking to themselves? Can I can I jump in for a second? Mm -hmm. um, so when I talked about that youth to prison, mm -hmm. uh, youth uh, that youth charged as adults issue mm -hmm. in Baltimore, and I talked about leaves of beautiful struggle, the Baltimore Al uh, Urban Debate League and yes. the Baltimore Algebra Project, I was talking about three organizations, uh, leaders of a beautiful struggle, was led by Dave on and a couple of others, all of them who have some relationship or some tie to one of those two organizations. Either they're from the Baltimore Algebra Project or they're from the urban, uh, Baltimore Urban Debate League. What happens is they don't just master the skills of policy for the purpose of, of uh, succeeding academically or for the purposes of winning policy debate, I mean, which they do, but what they do, at least in the Baltimore case, and I think there's evidence of others, what they've done successfully is taking those skill sets taking them back home to where they come from and then the use schools. them okay. no to the cities not the not cities. just back to, okay. no to the cities they okay. come from mm -hmm. and use them to transform policy debate or at least to in to weigh in on policy debate on the ground that youth to prison um jail isn't repealed without their efforts and it's not just their bodies it's them coming up with innovative tactics of protest and then connecting that to mastering political um, political speech so they're, they're weighing in on the policy, right? So that's, that's, for me, when I think about it, that's the sweet spot. Um, and I mentioned that's why I think that I was placed in the right place when I was in Baltimore, but it's because of that type of, it's that type of work. The work of our, our group, the, which is the city's research group, New York State Psychiatric Institute and Columbia University has been looking at the, all of these processes within the American city that have shattered neighborhoods. And so this has led us to think about how neighborhoods are organized. And neighborhoods have been systematically sorted out by race and by class over 100 years. And it's a very brutal set of policies that have subdivided groups and then subdivided them, and then subdivided them. And each time they're subdivided, they're also moved. They're relocated, breaking their intrinsic connections, both inside and outside. So each time people are moved away from each other, there's more creation of a sense of difference, this sort of creation of the other that becomes part then of the discourse, so that middle class African Americans are moved to different neighborhoods than poor African Americans in this process. So poor African Americans are moved to the projects and then they're like, well, they don't take care of where they live, and blah, blah, blah. Middle class African Americans are moved to houses, but then when there's a foreclosure crisis, they're like, well, they don't take care of their houses. So the, the same kinds of demonization, but at different periods and for different reasons, um, but they're divided and not helpful to each other. So I, we see it as part of this larger process of, of 
increasing differentiation of the American population. Yeah. Geodemographics, which invented this thing that Americans can be divided into 66 social groups. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the 66 social groups are, you can find them spatially, and they're not living together. So it's a huge problem of all American society, but it really ends up in this Tower of Babel where we're not talking to each other. And as a psychiatrist, the, the idea that you have 66 different groups who think they have different music, different clothes, different lifestyle, um, this is really problematic for communication. I would say, um, I mean, I would like for all groups that experience different forms of oppression to be able to have institutional protection against those in power. Um, I don't, I think it's important, particularly, you know, for, for black people in the United States and globally, that a lot of times the solutions, the, the solutions posed to many of our problems relies on us having faith that we live in a society that will one day um, understand that it is in everyone's interest that you know we all come together and protect people's interests and distribute resources so that people have the same opportunities. I just think in the meantime, you know, in terms of trying to reduce racism, for me, with the definition of racism um, that I think is the most appropriate, I think the struggle for me isn't trying to stop racism, right? It's to protect people from institutions that are racist and then eventually maybe we can you know do something to put a dent in racism but I think a lot of times the conversation about you know especially as black men you mentioned your question about being black men you know particularly many of us are encouraged you know to talk less about our own social location and personal experience you know and focus on kind of a global struggle for liberation and those are you know global struggle is important all these different things are connected um, but I just don't, just for me, survival, you know, the survival of young black boys in Baltimore hinges on having something that protects our interests. I mean, these are things that it's just in our interest to do. And to me, that takes primacy over kind of the larger questions of what to do about a racist institution like America and many of the institutions in, in it. Well, I, I view racism as a tool of politics to keep the mass of people, the have-nots, divided. And it's trotted out any time the have-nots threaten to get together. You know, say, wait, 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 we're not 66 groups, we're 99%. And then it's at that point racism is trotted out, and that's repeatedly through American history. And, and the more the have-nots threaten to say, wait, let's have equity, the more racism is, is drilled at them as, wait, 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 you can't trust those other people, they're not like you. So uh, to the extent that racism, I see racism as a tool of oppression, uh, the issue is, is always how do you help people understand that they have common interests? How do you help people get to that common conversation, the bigger conversation? And the, we, we're really mired in this fracture. And, and so the, the, the place, the table at which we might have the common conversation has been destroyed. So how do we recreate that? So um, somebody who works on cities, I consider myself an urbanist. So urbanists are people who study the ecology of cities. So what's the science of the city and how do we see the city? So the, the, the thesis really is that I'm, I am located in a particular community in a particular neighborhood, but I'm the citizen of the city. And I have to understand the city and I have to find my allies in the whole city. I have to find my allies in the region so I can get things done because I, I am too weak, I am too isolated. We are all too isolated, we are all too weak. And if we allow ourselves to be divided, the kinds of problems that we're up against, the unprecedented problems of long-term recession, of you know, capitalism being played out, of the environment, of the weather, they're just gonna overwhelm us. So what we see, um, using the American case, is what we see is the welfare state uh, being rolled back largely on the backs of non-white bodies, right? So as, um, as welfare begins to be associated in the minds with, uh, in people's minds with black women, 
Um, you see this belief that pe people, we should deal with poverty by making the poverty, you know, the poor find their own way. Um, as immigration is increasingly associated with Mexican bodies, right, we see people say, well, no, immigration, we should just make them, we should just kick them all out and retain the purity of our nation. Uh, we see evidence of those type of dynamics occurring in Europe, right, increasingly, right, with a goal to peel back the welfare state, just as Dr. Foley Love said. So I think our, our challenge, both in the United States and increasingly abroad, is to create, uh, is to create space for a larger conversation of what the public is supposed to mean and what the citizen looks like and is supposed to act like. And the, the, the better, more successful we are at that, the more likely we are in the U.S. case to, to claw back the idea of the public. Um, in the European case, to maintain the idea of the public, right? So you, you asked the question about um, racism. Some people would argue that because, ra will make a claim that because racism is systemic and enduring, there is no way to stop it. I think it's important to note that in all three of our cases, either implicitly or explicitly, we've igno we acknowledge that it's at the very least it's possible to create change to make people healthier. Right? So even if we say that racism is going to maintain, we still say, listen, you can use politics to make lives better. And for me, when I talk about clawing back the idea of the public, that's it, making lives better. So real quick, you, the question you asked me had a second part to it earlier at the beginning. Like, how do we incentivize the city to do new things with this money? It's about getting people together and giving them, and, 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 and giving them Enabling doesn't really work, but it's shorthand. It's enabling them to, uh, to say, okay, wow, we can do different things with our money. You know, people with different backgrounds, right? people from different races, to say, wow, the budget is uh, uh, $1.5 billion. What would you do with that money if you had it? How would you allocate it? Then compare that to how it is allocated, and then getting people to organize to have the allocation they want be more likely to resemble the allocation as it stands. You know, that's what it's about. I would say, um, so this, uh, Professor Dylan Rodriguez, he gets out in uh, Irvine, he, he uses this term multicultural white supremacy, right? And basically it's the idea that now as demographic shifts change, right, people of color will be used to maintain a system of white supremacy, right, where Europeans and European Americans maintain the political, economic, and social benefits um, of the system that we live in. Um, and I think what's important, we look at some of these, demo, uh, these demographic shifts and use, you know, Barack Obama as an example. I think part of the problem is, is that we relegate racism to being something of the right and not enough of the left. Right, and so it's important to understand that while the prison industrial complex is a right wing conservative, you know, move that was a part of the Reagan Revolution and a part of the rise of neoliberalism through Clinton and the rise of you know the prison industry, we also have to understand that at the same time on the left, right, we have folks that purport to speak for the masses, right, and make a living doing that. Right? And I think part of the issue that we need to make sure we deal with is the fact that there are too many of us who are in the communities who are being written about. Like our bodies are used as kind of the, the meal ticket for those who make a living, you know, going around the country and talking about these issues instead of actually empowering those to tell their stories to those who would benefit from it. So I think it's important that, and so, so with the, demo, the demographic shifts, I think, make it more right. I think particularly for the left, to begin to capitalize off that. So I think what's important is that there is fidelity to the issues that we're talking about in terms of social determinants, fidelity to the people that are most directly confronted by. And that's not to exclude people. That's not to say that you know only certain types of people can have certain conversations. But as to say, if you're going to talk about poverty of black folks in Baltimore, that it is black folks who are poor in Baltimore who are the ones speaking from their social location and those who are the ones that are the authority on that issue in conversation with others who have different issues. And I think, and then the one last thing I want to say is, is that I think sometimes it's important to recognize that similarities and differences put each other in context, right? So 
the experience of, of black folks and indigenous Native Americans and Latinos and so forth, we have similar but different material interests, right? In terms of the things that act on our bodies that we have to address, right? So for instance, you know, as a black man walking down the street, okay, there's, there's some, you know, there, there are images in people's minds of a threat, right? Whereas, you know, if an Asian American is walking down the street, that's not, they're not associated with that kind of threat. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, well, then how does that implicate the way that we organize to address particular issues? And, and what I would go as far as to say is, it's important to make sure that everybody's issues are authentically addressed and not because sometimes we can smooth over the particularities of the different interests that are involved in the room right and so it's important for those material interests to be represented and with the so the multi, the, a multicultural white supremacy would have the effect of smoothing over those particularities right saying that those issues are addressed when really many of them don't get addressed and I think there's a long history of that you know the civil rights movement you know, stuff that happened afterwards. Well, in the sorted out city, where everything is defined by race and class, everybody has their place and they're not supposed to transgress. So we are locked into a very rigid spatial apartheid. And, and your sons, my sons, are not supposed to be where black boys are not supposed to be. They're supposed to only be in their territory. And so we don't have freedom of the city. And so we live in a city that's, that's really literally compartmentalized, fractured, and then fundamentally dysfunctional as a city. And urbanism in the science of the city is really saying, wait a minute, here's this tool, this engine for living. And if we can liberate this tool, we can solve some of our, pro our common problems, which are gonna overwhelm us. These diseases, this global warming, it's gonna overwhelm us if we don't figure it out. We have, to, we have to get into a conversation together. We have to live together. And so yeah, part of what we have to do is fight for freedom of the city. We, we have to be free in the city, all of us. So I would just push you that, yeah, it's about, you gotta be thinking about the city and about how do we, how do we get everybody into the conversation? That's, there is a greater good here, which is the survival of all of us. All of us are in danger. And, and in New Jersey, you know that. But if you live in Baltimore, you might not have got here. Yeah. So, well, so what I, so the, 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 the point between the both of you is that it's a, for when I talk about the fight for the public, and the, the interracial dynamic of that, I think we know. But what you're bringing up to a certain extent is the intra-racial. You know, I'm the, I'm the parent of three boys. I have two girls as well. And in fact, I just had, um, I'm also in a black fraternity, and I'm still in touch with my fraternity members at the school I, gra I, went, I went to, which is the right school. And I was just talking to one of my own fraternity brothers about what they were doing at Michigan, and he was trying to police them, right? Because that's what you, when you talk about regulating your kids, where they go, that's a form of policing. And he didn't understand it when I, when I put that back on him, because he only understood policing as something whites did on blacks, right? But what we have to do is recognize policing where it occurs, both in, in, in interracial spaces and within black communities and Latino communities. So as the parent, you know, I would push against when those instincts in me come up, what I find myself doing is trying to push against them and say, you know what, no, because part of what my kids have to do is they have to be able to take the public and say, no, I'm supposed to be here. Right, this is my city, I'm supposed to be here. 